Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here, across the street, and around the world. Our sanctuary continues to remain closed for reasons of health and safety, but we welcome you from around the world. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Today we celebrate the second Sunday uh, in Lent as we continued our preparation for Easter, as we seek to be the disciples we would like to be, as we seek for a closer walk with Jesus. We do have available a Lenten Bible study. There's information about that in the announcements that were emailed yesterday. And uh, there are other opportunities in the announcements that were emailed, ways to celebrate and to mark Lent. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in supporting Christ's ministry here. Your faithfulness and generosity allows our ministry to continue. At 1045 is an opportunity to uh, do a free conference call, a little chat time after worship. So dial the number that was emailed in yesterday's uh, e-blast and uh, Dan will let us in at the appropriate time when he's ready. I'm being helped today to lead worship by Dakota, the son of Christine, our church administrator. He's an active member of D. Malay. Dakota, call us to worship. This is the call to worship. Christ calls all who want to follow him to deny themselves and take up their cross. Let us follow Christ and praise the Lord. As a sign of the reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God, and our desire to be reconciled with others, we announce God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with us all. Christ our Lord invites all who love him to earnestly repent of our sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not been sincere Christians. We claim to follow Jesus, but have not taken his path of sacrificial love. We profess to be disciples, but we are not willing to bear the cost of discipleship. We affirm the virtue of self-denial, but we indulge our selfish desires. Forgive us and free us for sincere repentance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray in silence. Hear the good news. God deems us righteous, all who trust the Jesus, all that trust Jesus has been raised from the dead for our salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As a praying congregation, as we get ready to go to God in prayer, I'm going to be sharing with you some concerns and joys of which I'm aware. If you recognize any of these folk that I named, please call them or send them a card. Let them know that they're in our prayers. I bid your prayers this week for the family and friends of Robert, the brother of Russ and Jeanette. Uh, He died this past Sunday after a short time on hospice care at home. I bid your prayers for Elena, the daughter of Michelle and Dean. She's having surgery tomorrow to repair a knee injury, and her recovery will last about six months. I bid your prayers for Jerry, the husband of Pat and a member of our chancel choir. Jerry is recuperating from shoulder repair surgery he had this past week. He'll be undergoing rehab for at least a month. I bid your prayers for Laura, a friend of Susie and a breast cancer survivor. She now has cancer in her lungs and lymph nodes and has a lot of testing to undergo. I bid your prayers for Carolyn, the wife of John. She's undergoing medical testing. Pray that they find the right diagnosis and that it's treatable. I bid your prayers for Connie, the wife of Harry and a member of our chancel choir. Uh, Connie is dealing with pain in her hands. Pray for relief. I bid your prayers for Ginger, the mother of Jennifer, on our praise team. Ginger is undergoing medical testing. 
And I bid your prayers for Dan and Adam, the husband and son of Leslie. Uh, They are recuperating from falls they experienced on the ice recently. And Adam is also recovering from hand surgery. And Leslie is recuperating from something uh, that's flu-like. I bid your prayers for all those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. For all those who are battling COVID, including Phil and Candy's daughter-in-law, Becca, John and Carolyn's nephew, Jimmy. Jimmy's wife, Audrey, is presently hospitalized with pneumonia and, and probably COVID, but we don't know that for sure. I bid your prayers for all those in quarantine. And I bid your prayers for those who work in public health, for medical workers, caregivers, and researchers everywhere. I bid your prayers this week for school teachers, students, and staff in our schools as as our schools here in Harford County are returning to in-person teaching. Let us thank God this week that Billy, the mother of Ron, Kathy, and Mary Ann, is healing well from her hip replacement and is grateful for all our prayers and cards. Let us thank God that Joyce, the sister of Sandy, our financial secretary, although she must undergo follow-up radiation and treatment, is told that she is cancer-free following her recent surgery. Let us praise God that Tina, the mother of Jean, the mother-in-law of Tom, who was widowed in December and had to move from her home into a retirement community near Jean and Tom, is now adjusting very well. Let us praise God for all those who have successfully recovered from COVID-19. And let us thank God for all the medical workers, vaccinators, makers of medical equipment, and essential workers who are keeping things shipped and stocked for us. Let us thank God this week for the gift of Carson Mitchell, Jim's great-grandson from Illinois, who Jim got to meet for the first time last weekend. At 15 months, this child already has 8 to 10 words in sign language. And let us thank God for the birth of Barbara May, the great-granddaughter of Peg, uh, who was born recently weighing almost 9 pounds and measuring 22 inches in length. With our hearts and minds full of all these joys and concerns, let us name in silent prayer before God all those joys and concerns that I have not mentioned. Merciful God, you know the shortness of our lives and the frailties of our bodies and our spirits. Comfort the grieving that their sadness may not overwhelm them. Heal those who struggle with physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual health. Protect all those who work to keep us safe and to keep us supplied with what we need. Especially guide and guard all who are attending or running our schools, that they may be willing learners, effective providers, and safe participants. Help us all to keep our eyes on Jesus and His kingdom, that we may not fall prey to shallow or short-sighted goals, but may be inspired to be strong, brave, and true disciples willing to make sacrifices on behalf of our Savior. Lord God, thank you for healing, for comfort, and for the power of prayer. Thank you for those who surround us with their love and care and their prayers. Thank you for your help making difficult changes and transitions in life. Thank you, Lord, for new lives born among us and the blessing of new generations. Thank you most of all. Thank you most of all for the leadership of Jesus, our Messiah, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship service when I get to talk for just a moment with the children. And so I greet today Max and Zoe, Wyatt and Scout, Amelia and Will, Breezy and Ileana. I greet Elena and Eli, Michael and Lillian, Hazel and Iris, Emmy and Andrew, 
Taylor and Ellie, Ian and Bodie, Jesse and Maddie, Jordana and Jasper, Ben, Charlie and Ellie, Evelyn and Camille, Charlotte and Lorelai and Lola and Molly and Adeline and Riley and Macy and Haley. And if I didn't call your name, I greet you too. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. Most of us know about Jesus because we were born into a family where they have told us about Jesus, where they made sure that we know about Jesus. We might say that we're followers of Jesus by accident, simply because we were born in a household where folk know Jesus. But Jesus wants to follow him not by accident, but on purpose. Jesus wants his followers to follow him because We choose to, not because someone told us to, but because we volunteered to follow him. So at home, for instance, we can choose to be helpers, to help our mom or dad or sister or brother do something. Or we can choose to be cheerful when we are told that we must help. You know, sometimes our parents will tell us, You need to do this. I want you to do this. Well, we're not volunteering to do it. They're telling us to do it. And we might be tempted to grumble about that or or to complain or to pout or maybe to sulk a little bit about it. But we can choose to be cheerful, to do it even though we don't want to and be cheerful about it. Jesus wants us to be cheerful, cheerful followers who volunteer to follow him. So this week, when you look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, I want you to smile at yourself. Give yourself a smile. In other words, practice smiling. So when those moments come when you don't want to smile, and there are moments when we don't want to smile, we can anyway, because we've practiced it. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to volunteer to help. And help us be cheerful about doing those things we're asked to do but don't want to. Thank you for loving us so much that you came to us in Jesus to show us that love. Thank you for Jesus our friend. Amen. Remember this week when you look in the mirror, smile at yourself. Practice smiling so when you don't want to, you still can. Thank you very much. And now, a reading from the Gospel, from Mark, chapter 8, verse 31 to 38. Peter has just made the wonderfully insightful statement that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus, however, tells them to keep the secret. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who will lose their life for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Today, on the second Sunday in Lent, we continue a sermon series 
exploring the subversive power of Christ. The subversive power of Christ. In his life, we see how radical self-sacrifice has a power to subvert the forces of injustice. How Jesus exemplifies for us how self-sacrifice subverts the structures of injustice. He simply turns the world upside down. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus calls us to save others, and he calls us to save others by serving them. But the good news is that we are saved in the process. That we are saved in the process. Our gospel lesson is a pivotal point in the life of Christ. The Apostle Peter has just made the wonderfully insightful statement that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus tells his followers to keep this news secret. And he begins to reframe for them what Messiah means, what being Messiah is going to mean. Messiah would not be what was typically expected, that is, a conquering hero who would free the people from political repression by the Romans. Instead, instead the Messiah would suffer and be rejected by the religious leaders and be killed. And this is so shocking an idea that Peter and Jesus have a sharp verbal conflict. Then, because Peter stands in for all of us, who have ever been confused by Jesus, and let's be honest, a lot of times we find the things Jesus says confusing. Because Peter stands in for all of us, Jesus pivots in that moment and turns to the crowd and faces the crowd to teach them. That is, to teach us. To teach us. We're the crowd. So that means that we're included in the story. And what he says is, if we want to be his followers, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. We must be willing to suffer too. Sometimes we refer to difficulties in life and challenges that we face as bearing our cross. It's our cross to bear. But Jesus does not mean this. He refers to something we choose to do in his service not something that life puts upon us. Bishop Joseph Yagel, when he was our bishop, used to tell the story from early in his ministry that he had a blind church keyboard musician. And one day he said something to her about her blindness being her cross to bear. And she corrected him. And she said, Pastor I was born blind. It is what I choose to do for Christ's sake that is my cross to bear. I was born blind. My cross is something I take up for Jesus' sake. I do think, however, that sometimes how we react to the challenges of life or, or hardships can be a cross. We can intentionally choose to react in a positive rather than a negative way. And then in our gospel lesson comes Jesus, perhaps Jesus' hardest and strangest teaching of all. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Several things from this gospel passage speak to us. First of all, notice that Jesus works with us to help us grow in faith and wisdom. Peter, like us, gets it wrong. But Jesus does not reject Peter. He redirects him and redirects us when we get off track too. Jesus uses Peter's conflict with him as a teachable moment. That's why he includes the crowd. That's why he includes us. So we can benefit too. Second, we need saving. Our lives need saving. 
That's why we're here engaging in worship. Either we know we've been saved by Jesus or we sense we need to be saved. But do we admit it? Do we admit that we need salvation? Ash Wednesday begins Lent by reminding us of our mortality and our sin, our separation from God. We indeed need saving. Third, there's something very deep here about saving or losing ourselves that needs to be unpacked. Jesus is not calling us to be masochists, to engage in self-harm. That is not mentally healthy. And God wants us to be wholesome and whole people. God wants wholeness for us and health, not for us to be crippled. Even Jesus, remember, did not throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple when tempted to do so by Satan. And we are called to be disciples, not doormats. Disciples, not doormats for others to abuse. Now, Jesus may be speaking here of literal martyrdom. Certainly, many of his followers died for their faith in the early days of the church, and we have their stories. That's part of our church history. We don't typically face the stark choice between loyalty to Christ and physical death, but there is a deeper meaning here. Christ calls us to let go of our self-centeredness, to reveal the more beautiful world that God wants. He calls us to continually die to our self-interest for the good of our friends, our neighbors, and yes, even our enemies. The truth is we can gain all the worldly wealth, fame, success, relationships, and so on, but lose ourselves, forfeit our souls. Those worldly things ultimately leave us unfulfilled and just hungering for more. We see celebrities all the time in the news who seem to have it all, to have achieved the American dream, but who act in ways that show that they are really quite miserable. With fame, wealth and fame and sex and success do not lead to true and lasting joy. Instead, they leave a gaping hole that no thing can fill. I've noticed that the return address on boxes that come from Amazon read Amazon Fulfillment Services. And I know that it means that they're working to fulfill our orders, but it always makes me chuckle a little bit. Fulfillment. True fulfillment doesn't come from Amazon, and it certainly doesn't come in a box. Jesus says by turning from selfishness to selflessness, we really can find the peace and meaning we all seek. But this takes faith. It takes courage to begin sacrificially serving others. This Lent, we have the opportunity to try this different way of being, this Jesus way of being, this transformative posture. So we can begin by pondering who it is that needs saving in our world. Who is, who is it that needs to be rescued from poverty or abuse or racism and so on? And then we can take our eyes off of ourselves and joyfully, sacrificially serve others. By doing so, Jesus promises, we will save our lives and experience abundant life. For by losing ourselves in the service of Christ, we are saved. We see examples all around us of those who have been saved by serving others, who have set out to save the world and found themselves to have been saved. Kavanaugh Bell, an eight-year-old boy from Gaithersburg, Maryland, was the victim of bullying, and so he started an anti-bullying campaign. And then the pandemic struck, and he saw the needs that others have, and so he started a food bank, and using his own savings, he bought toiletries and groceries. Then he started a program to help seniors and others dealing with the pandemic on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. He has received the governor's citation. He's been recognized by President Biden, uh, both of them recognizing him for his work to improve life in this world. 
but it is the value he has gained for his own life and selfhood that is truly rewarding. Many folk have gone on mission trips, including our own youth and leaders, and have returned saying they gained more from the experience than they felt they gave. I have a colleague who came back from serving the folk in Haiti saying he was humbled by the much stronger faith of the Haitian people. He learned a lot, he said, from them. In battling the COVID pandemic, we wear these masks, not because the state forces us to, but as a choice to love our neighbors. We don't wear them because we're better than others. We don't wear them as a badge of privilege. We don't wear them because we think Others are dirty and we're clean. We don't wear them to impress folk. We don't wear them for self-protection. We don't wear them to make political points. And we don't wear them to flaunt our wealth. In fact, they may be inconvenient, uncomfortable, or steam up our glasses. We wear them to protect others. Our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our customers, and even strangers on the street. It is a sacrifice. Not going out with family and friends when we would like to. Not going to the gym or the store or family reunion when we would dearly love to. And when we see others all around us living quite differently and acting in ways that are not safe and getting away with it, that's a sacrifice. Keeping our buildings closed when others are not is a sacrifice. It is a cross we choose to bear but it is our own lives we save, both our physical lives and our spiritual lives, as we set aside our wants for the sake of others' safety and thereby show the world how Christians love. Christ calls us to save others' lives by serving them. This takes radical self-sacrifice. But the good news is that Jesus promises us this will bring us the peace and meaning we seek, For when we take our eyes off of ourselves and lose ourselves in the service of Christ, we are saved and the world is transformed. This Lent, may we take the chance to try this different way of being, the way of Christ's cross. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our theme hymn today, uh, for which I'll simply read the lyrics, was written by Charles Everest, a 19th century Episcopal priest who served up in Connecticut. He bases this hymn on our gospel lesson today, and then he amplifies it a bit to point out that although the cross we bear may seem heavy, God gives us the strength to carry it. And then the last stanza, he ends kind of on a phrase that's common uh, across the church. You may have heard no cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. That's how he ends, ends the hymn. He says, Take up thy cross, the Savior said, if thou wouldst my disciple be. Deny thyself, the world forsake, and humbly follow after me. Take up thy cross, let not its weight fill thy weak spirit with alarm. His strength shall bear thy spirit up, and brace thy heart, and Nerve thine arm, take up thy cross, nor heed the shame, nor let thy foolish pride rebel. Thy Lord for thee the cross endured to save thy soul from death and hell. Take up thy cross and follow Christ, nor think till death to lay it down, for only those who bear the cross may hope to wear the glorious crown. As we recommit our lives to the service of others in Jesus' name, thank you for your continued faithfulness and generosity and support of Christ's ministry here. And now let us pray in silence as we ponder when we've been rescued from something or someone and what cross Christ is calling us to take up.
Let us pray. O self-giving God, receive our gifts and our commitments as tokens of our desire to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Use them to serve and save others. Thank you for your sacrificial love in rescuing us from our own self-defeating sin through the cross of Christ in whose name we serve and in whose name we pray. Amen. And now, my friends, go in peace to live what we have learned, share the message we have heard, and be a light to the world. Go in peace, knowing God's Spirit goes before us. Go in peace to follow where Christ leads. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.